Welcome into Hitting Hard with John Chuckery here on Locked On Sports Atlanta. Today on the show, oh ye of little faith, Braves may need a new starter. And is this really it? It's all next. It's Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, Locked On Sports Atlanta. This is Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta. And it starts now. Hitting Hard is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We ask you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast. Get the latest episodes of Hitting Hard as soon as they become available. Check us out on the Sirius XM app as well and give me a follow on my personal Twitter page at JMCH316. So Bleacher Report had an article that I was reading through that was put out by Alex K. And... The title of the article is <clears throat> Fact or Fiction, Deciding Which NFL Teams Will Break Through the Playoff Drought in 2023. Now, as we know, the Falcons are one of five teams that have not reached the playoffs over the last five years. Falcons, Carolina, Denver, the Lions, and the Jets. Falcons remain in rebuilding mode. They failed to unearth a franchise quarterback this offseason. Club didn't have a suitable heir in place for aging Matt Ryan before shipping him off last year and likely still doesn't, barring an unexpected breakout from third-round pick Desmond Ritter. That's unfortunate given just how much the team has invested into wide receiver, tight end, running back position in in recent years. The Falcons employ some of the league's most promising up-and-coming skill position players in London, Pitts, Robinson, but they lack the passer to truly back or sorry, to truly unlock their collective potential. Until the team finds a capable quarterback, the ceiling on this offense will be too low to compete with the league's best on a weekly basis. Defensively, the Falcons should improve upon last year's disappointing performance after allowing 362.1 yards per game, 22.7 points per game in 2022. Atlanta went on a veteran, uh, sorry, Atlanta went after veteran pieces such as Jesse Bates, David Onyemata, and on the open market and select Zach Harris and Clark Phillips in the third and fourth rounds of the draft, respectively. There, These may not be enough to push the Falcons into the league's upper echelon, but it should get them closer to middle of the pack. While Atlanta is loaded with rising stars on offense and boasts a improving defense, the lack of star power under center will be this team's undoing, barring a drastic move. This team is in real danger of lingering in the NFL's version of purgatory, faring well enough to miss out on a top pick, but not being strong enough to contend for the playoffs. And they say fiction, the Falcons will not break their five-year playoff drought in 2023. So, a lot to digest there, okay? So, obviously, they put everything on Desmond Ritter, okay? And again, and, and, and I understand the reasons why, right? I mean, we get that you have to have that franchise quarterback if your team is going to take into that next stratosphere, right? No doubt about it. I mean, again, look at the Bills, look at the Kansas City Chiefs, you know, those franchises, look at the Cincinnati Bengals. You know, again, they really, you know, again, they made they made that leap when they figured out that they had their guy under center and they became Super Bowl contenders. And in Cincinnati's case, they went to the Super Bowl. And in Kansas City's case, they win multiple Super Bowls. I don't think, though, that this is all on Desmond Ritter, though. And I continue to say this. Like, there are the, – the way that this team is built is that – and, again, I'm not saying that they don't want a franchise quarterback in place. I'm not saying that Arthur Smith isn't looking for the franchise's next Matt Ryan. But they can certainly win, and they can certainly be a playoff team with Desmond Ritter at quarterback. And I think that's the thing that keeps getting lost about this. Look, does Desmond Ritter have to play well? Yes. I mean, he does have to play well. He can't be, you know, nine touchdowns and 22 interceptions and throw for 1,800 yards and complete 50% of his back. He can't do that. But there's no reason to think that he can't be a capable quarterback. And look, the results are this. They went two and two in their last four games. Now, you can say what you will about that. I know it's only a four-game sample size and all this good kind of stuff. 
But still, the fact that they went two and two, I mean, that's better than what Marcus Mariota did. So, again, I think you have to have faith in Desmond Ritter. But I will definitely tell you, this is not all about Ritter. You know, they have to have London and Pitts especially and guys like this step their game up. Defensively, they have to, you know, win at the line of scrimmage. You know, we we talk about this ad nauseum, but they don't have playmakers and star players at positions that are most important on the football field. They don't have difference makers at the point of attack where games are won and lost. And I'll continue to beat this drum until I see it. Until I actually physically watch this team line up and dominate on the defensive line of scrimmage, rather than just kind of floundering around, no matter how many safeties and corners that you sign, I'll I'll continue to bang this drum. Again, the San Francisco 49ers have been to five of the last 10 conference title games, okay? They've had three different quarterbacks, nobody of which is a first-round upper echelon talent. It's been Kaepernick, Garoppolo, and Brock Purdy. That's the three guys they've had at quarterback. They've had two head coaches over that decade period. And yet, why have they been in a game to play in the Super Bowl five of the last 10 years? Would would we love to be in five conference title games in a 10-year stretch? Sure. But why have they been able to do that? Why do you think that they have been able to go five times in 10 years with three quarterbacks and two different head coaches? Let's all say it together because they're the best line of scrimmage team in the NFL. They have been for this decade run. They have been the best line of scrimmage team in the NFL, whether it's Trent Williams in their offensive line or Bosa and Varner and Armstead and, you know, again, all, Buckner and all these guys they've had. They, <coughs> they've they been both the best offensive and defensive line of scrimmage team in the NFL consistently now for a decade. That's why. They've had Brock Purdy. They've had Colin Kaepernick. They've had Jimmy Garoppolo. And yet they've been able to play for a chance to go to the Super Bowl. And in Garoppolo's case, they did go to the Super Bowl. It's not hard to figure out these things. Why? Yes, again, what's the difference as to why they haven't always succeeded getting to the Super Bowl or why they haven't won a Super Bowl? Because they don't have that difference maker quarterback. They don't have Mahomes or Burrow or somebody like that. But if you can control the lines of scrimmage on both sides of the football, you can make a heck of a run in it. I'd like to have five conference titles in in 10 years. I'd like to be able to go to that, that point. So again, not everything is going to be about Desmond Ritter. Not everything falls on his shoulders at the end of the day. You have to have guys step up. Look, Kyle Pitts has got to step his game up. He's got to be Travis Kelsey. Well, he's got to have somebody deliver the football. Okay, they need to figure that out then. No reason to draft Kyle Pitts if you can't get him the football and and he's Travis Kelsey. There's no reason to have him on the roster then. That's the reality of it. So not everything is about Desmond Ritter. I don't think Desmond Ritter's the problem. I think he'll be a capable quarterback. Will he be all NFL or, you know, Uh, MVP of the league? No. Or then we're in the Super Bowl. But again, a lot of guys have to step their game up. I think they don't have a lot of faith in what the roster as a whole is. And I don't think that they're looking at the big picture of what this is. We'll, We'll narrow it down. Let's get a winning record, get to the playoffs. Then we can look and see as whether or not Desmond Ritter is a franchise caliber quarterback. But again, Garoppolo, Kaepernick, Brock Purdy, I would love to be in five of the last 10 NFC championship games with with guys with multiple quarterbacks, multiple head coaches. I would love that for a franchise. Let's get to that point first, then we can figure out what our franchise quarterback is. 
All right, this episode is brought to you by FanDuel. And look, as the Major League Baseball season is in its second half, FanDuel has got you covered with betting on baseball. It's America's number one sports book. Take your first swing at betting on MLB on FanDuel and get 10 times your first bet in bonus bets. 10 times your first bet in bonus bets. So bet 20 bucks and you can land as much as $200 in bonus bets, whether you win or whether you lose. That's $200 you can spend uh, on betting on everything from the money line to over-unders to who you think is going to hit the first home run. Obviously, FanDuel is a safe, secure, super easy-to-use application, and most importantly is you get paid instantly, right? When you win, you get paid instantly. So no better place to bet on uh, MLB than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N, and get your $200 worth of bonus bets, win or lose, fanduel.com slash locked on, fanduel.com slash L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N. Fanduel is the official partner of Major League Baseball. So it's becoming more obvious that the Braves probably have to add a starter in somewhere. You know, Bryce Elder's had not uh, two rough start. And when I say rough, like he's been roughed up, you know, six innings and 12 earned runs. I don't know what the deal is there, but, you know, again, he's been bebopped around and everything like that. And if you look, it's been four of his last eight starts where he's gotten, you know, popped around and he's not pitched well. So over his, you know, last quarter of his season starts, he's not pitched very well. Then last night, Charlie Morton had, you know, a rough outing. And believe it or not, the last time Charlie Morton had, had lost, he'd, he'd won, what, four? No, sorry, five straight decisions. He had won five straight decisions up till last night. The last time he had lost was when they pitched in Arizona. So <laughs> lost to the same team twice in, you know, a little over a month and a half. But he was roughed up last night as well. Five and two-thirds, six hits, four earned runs, three walks, four strikeouts. Did not give up a home run but did throw 103 pitches in that five and two-thirds innings. And the Braves go down in defeat, and this is going to be their second series in a row that they've lost. They've lost, what, four straight now? And it's going to be their second series in a row that they've dropped. Now, look, you got Zach Gallon on the mound versus Spencer Strider. That's a all-star pitching matchup, right? Zach Gallon was the starter for the NL All-Star team. Obviously, Strider was on the team but did not pitch. Nobody pitched for the Braves, but... It's a big time matchup, and the Braves need to win. I mean, the Braves, you know, now again, one game in the grand scheme of things over 162 games is not going to be the difference. But again, you're starting to see that there are little, you know, chunks and chinks, you know, in the armor that the Braves need to figure out a way to just kind of get back on track and just feel good about themselves. Because again, they're going to go to Milwaukee, and six of their next eight games are going to be against the division leading Milwaukee Brewers. And again, I don't necessarily fear the Brewers. You know, when we've lined up against them in the past, we've kind of handled them. But again, you're on the road. You know, again, the Braves have been obviously outstanding on the road, but you're on the road against a division leader. Um, six of the next, you know, eight times. Again, they're not all on the road, but three in, three in Milwaukee. Then you got two games in Boston, and then you got three at home against uh, the Bucks, or sorry, the Brewers in Truist Park. But they pitched really well, and you know their offense is kind of coming around. Yelich is having a nice season. Um, maybe could have been an All Star, but again, he's not at the same level that he was a few years ago, where he was MVP of the league. But it does look like the Braves maybe need to get themselves a starter, and, and whether that's you know one of the Cardinal guys in Flaherty or what have you, whether that's one of the White Sox guys in Giolito or Lance Lynn or whoever, you know, I don't know that they're going to give up a lot of capital to get a starting pitcher. I don't know that they're going to give up a lot of assets to get a starting pitcher, but certainly it would be an idea that, look, the, the reality of your rotation is Elder's struggling. Maybe he's hitting a little bit of a wall. Morton has been good up until last night, but okay, just to make sure that he doesn't get off track or kilter, you know, because again, he's having a really good bounce back here. Strider's, you know, gotten his roughed up moments and stuff of late, but Okay, let's let's you know figure Strider is, is good to go, and you're waiting for Max Freed to eventually get back into this rotation. Okay, maybe that's end of July, maybe that's first part of August. 
No idea when Kyle Wright is, is going to be there. You know, Soroka getting his sea legs back. And it's not panic mode. I mean, this is not a panic move. It's just a provide some stability kind of move, which is what we've been talking about, the idea of, look, their starting rotation is forming into becoming a plus for this team. The way Elder and Strider and Morton have pitched this year, they've really been able to carry the load. And you are going to get Max Fried back, and you're working Michael Soroka into the mix. But in the short term, and, and, and you might not even be looking for a guy who is going to get the ball come playoff time, right? Because, again, you've got the guys that you need for playoff time. You've got Strider and Morton, and you'll have Max Fried. Maybe you'll have Kyle Wright. But, again, you know, Elder, I mean, okay. So you, you have enough starting pitching that when you get to the playoffs, whether it's four guys or five guys that you're going to have available to you. But in the short term, just to get some of these guys over the hump a little bit, and, and get them kind of back on track, you know, help figure out what is going on, maybe experiment a little bit or what have you, because the Braves are in a comfortable position. I mean, let's face it, they, they you know, still lead the division by a crap ton of games. Again, they lead the division by, if you, if, I did this experiment the other night, when they had a 10 and a half game lead over the um, uh, Marlins, um, if, you, if you combined all of the other divisions in baseball, the, the Braves had almost as big a lead as every other division in baseball combined. So the Braves are in good shape. I mean, it's not a matter of panicking or, oh my gosh, we got to go out and get, you know, 15 guys. And no, I mean, you probably are looking for a starter that can bridge the gap a little bit to get you through some of this and get you through some of these rough times. Maybe that is a Lance Lynn. Maybe that is a Lucas Giolito. Maybe that is a Jack Flaherty. You know, I'm not saying that you got to go out and get, an all-star caliber pitcher and you got to get an ace on your staff. You know, we've got some aces on our staff and, and Morton has been really good this year. We talked about yesterday about the fact that he's on pace to set his career high in wins. So I don't really have any fears about that, but again, just providing some stability in this rotation, just to give you an extra arm. Maybe if you want to skip a start for Bryce Elder and give him a little bit of rest or what have you, I don't know. I mean, I'm just spitballing out here, but again, they need to get themselves back on track. And, and listen, it would go a long way for Spencer Strider to outduel Zach Gallon today in a businessman special and get themselves back on track, get a win, and then head up to Milwaukee on a high note and feel good about yourself. Even though you lost the series, at least feel good about yourself that you get, you broke your four game winning streak. And then we'll see what happens, you know, in Milwaukee. Like I said, six of the next eight games are going to be against the Brewers who lead their division in the NL Central. And then you got the dreadful Red Sox for just a two-game set up in Baston. So maybe the Braves need to find themselves a, a trigger man and, and, and pull off a trade. I don't think they want to give up a lot of capital. I'm not looking for, you know, a, an all-star 20-game winning starting pitcher, but maybe just to kind of let the Braves breathe a little bit, slow things down a little bit, and and find that guy that just can kind of provide a little bit more stability until we get everybody else up to speed, until we get Soroka and Freed and maybe eventually right up to speed. Maybe just need that bridge guy to make this thing happen. <clears throat> All right, as you listen in to Hitting Hard, make sure that you go in and whatever podcast platform that you're listening on, let us know that you're an everyday listener to the program. So let us know that you're an everydayer, as we like to call them. And we thank you so much for being a part of our growing community. And listen, we appreciate uh, every day your contributions to being a part of this audience. But let us know that you're an everyday listener to the program that you listen in five days a week. So is this it? I mean... We're sitting around, you know, we're kind of twiddling our thumbs, you know, waiting for the Hawks to make another move. And there hasn't been kind of, you know, we've heard a lot of rumor and innuendo. And I heard Steve Coonan on uh, with our afternoon show last week on the radio station talking about, well, you know, we've we've been close. You know, we've been close to pulling the trigger on different deals. And I, I don't know what that means. Again, you know, it's isn't close, you know, close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. I mean. Is that kind of the reality of it? I mean, as of right now, and I'll continue to beat this drum too, 
we're not a better roster than when we were when we finished the season. When we lost to the Boston Celtics and it was game number six and we were out of the playoffs, we're not a better roster today than we were then. I don't care what draft picks and all that kind of stuff. All these guys who moved Usman Garuba and and Ty Ty Washington and all these guys that we've moved around to save money. <clears throat> this offseason has been another offseason about saving money. Now, that could change. We get Siakam and, you know, do something. I mean, I don't, I don't know. But right now it seems like we're just kind of in purgatory, like we're just kind of lingering around. Now, again, October 2nd is a ways down the road. That's when training camp opens up, right? NBA training camps open up, I think it's October 2nd, October 3rd, somewhere in that very first part of October. So we're, we're you know, down the road, but I'm going to tell you, it's going to be August here pretty quickly, and things are going to move along. And the NBA is in a situation where they've got some international things that are going on as well. But by and large, free agency has kind of quieted down. I mean, there's not a lot of big players that are on the move. <clears throat> you know, there's always this big flurry, and, and there's always a trade that kind of comes out of nowhere before the season starts. So maybe that's going to happen. But as of right now, you know, again, for as important as this offseason was to get this franchise back on track. And again, what have we talked about for a year plus now? Swing that pendulum back to, okay, we're headed toward the Eastern Conference Finals versus we're barely even getting into the playoffs through the play-in game. Things have to kind of, that pendulum has to swing back toward us being one of the better franchises in the NBA. And right now, that's not happening. And right now, we're not a better roster than we were at the end of the playoffs. You can miss me with rookies and all this other kind of stuff. We're not a better roster talent-wise than what we were. But it's all about, you know, saving money and this, that, and the other. And the and the Hawks have a little bit of cap space. I think they have $9 million of cap. But does that mean they're going to go in the luxury tax? Does that mean that they're going to use their $25 million exemption to get themselves back in the luxury tax? I have my doubts. And if we look, if we start the year kind of as is, you know, like with, with this roster with again, maybe a tweak here and a tweak there at the end of the bench, but not any, not adding any more star power onto this team. Then I'll know what this is. Then, then I'll, 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 it'll be exactly what I told you was going to be that. I didn't have any faith. It would be in the luxury tax. I didn't have any faith that, that this was about trying to better the basketball roster, that this was about trying to construct a roster that gets you under the luxury tax, even though that you have a super max player on your roster, which is not easy to do. When, when you have a guy that takes up about a third of the cap on a super on a um, super max deal, a, a, a guy that takes up about a third of the cap as far as getting into the luxury tax, it's hard to do. It's hard to do when you have one guy that takes up that kind of money. And at the same time, build a winner around him. Tough to do. And I'm not saying that Trey Young doesn't deserve his contract. It's just a matter of the financial expectations that come along with that. You're going to have to dip your foot into uh, the luxury tax. So, again, we're kind of twiddling our thumbs here. You know, I don't know that there's any, you know, Alex Anthopoulos type of move that's going to be made in all of this. And I've said consistently, I think they're going to, by and large, run this thing back. I was hoping for lots of change and hope and change and all these things that come across, but I've got a feeling that they're by and large going to run this roster back. I mean, certainly teams are looking to finalize their deals and you would think that, okay, if a deal was going to happen, that something would have already percolated. There's been plenty of time to work out a deal with either Siakam or Clint Capella to Dallas or whatever. You think that there's been plenty of time to make some things happen. GMs want to get their roster in place and kind of focus on working together. Now that we're through summer league action, working together and kind of getting themselves prepped and ready to go before we get to training camp. So again, we'll see what happens, you know, here, but as of right now, they're kind of just twiddling their thumbs. They're kind of just sitting back and just kind of, I don't know what they're doing. I don't say that. I don't think that they're relaxing. I think they're looking to make deals, but this has been a very underwhelming off season. And as of right now, we're not a better roster. 
I hope that when we get to training camp and we get to October 3rd or 2nd or whatever that first day of training camp is, I hope that I can point and say, okay, now we're a better roster. Now, now we've made moves to make ourselves a better roster versus we've just kind of saved money. We've just kind of get ourselves under the cap and everything else, you know, along with it. Hopefully that this is, you know, a situation where there's going to be a late trade that's going to happen or some kind of magical free agent signing or something. Just give me signs and hope that we're not just going to just kind of run this thing back and having saved some money on the salary cap. Hopefully that this is a situation where we make one last move to better our roster and we feel like that we're a more, you know, a, 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 a more, what I want to say, a, a better talent roster going into training camp and opening up this season. I have my doubts, but we'll see. We'll give Landry Fields the benefit of the doubt until we don't have to give him the benefit of the doubt. All right, well, thank you so much for making Hit and Hard with John Chuck. When you first listen, be sure to go in and leave us a comment on whatever podcast platform that you listen on. Let us know that you're an everyday listener to the program. So we call them our everydayers. We thank you so much for being a part of our growing community. And obviously, we thank you so much for being on this journey with us. You can check us out and subscribe for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast and get the latest episodes of Hit and Hard as soon as they become available. Check us out on the Sirius XM app as well and give me a follow on my personal Twitter page, at JMCH316. Back with you tomorrow to wrap up the week. This has been Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, Locked on Sports Atlanta. 